Today on Demystifying Science, we're looking at how there are two opposing forces that steer the course of consensus science. Quality of thought on one hand, and narrative control on the other. It's an exploration that was inspired by our conversation with a next generation propulsion researcher and the host of the beloved YouTube channel, Alien Scientist. Jeremy has grown a community around cutting edge engineering and has started a lab that builds and tests various prototypes to see what gems may have fallen through the cracks of history. The hard thing about this process is that anyone interested in nature's kitchen is going to have to wade through a ton of dead-end ideas before finding something that's worth following. But extreme patience rewards the seeker, for even the most insane theorists will occasionally produce a pearl of wisdom. If researchers on the cutting edge dismissed everything that the mainstream labeled as pseudoscience, though, maps of the universe would probably still have Earth at their center. Yep, so in this episode, we're talking about that powerful pejorative term, pseudoscience, which conflates the two ideas, outright charlatanry and scientific heresy, where pseudoscience is invoked to silence challengers to the status quo. So buckle up folks, it's time to demystify some science. So the scientists that get paid to do a study for Big Pharma, for example, and the reports are skewed in the favor of the, the people giving them the funding, is that pseudoscience? So just because you can get empirical formulas to describe things doesn't mean that, that that's the essence of what's happening. By ridiculing perceived threats, competition, and inconveniences to preferred theories with words like cranky, loony, or pseudoscientific, it's possible to silence alternatives to business as usual. But as we'll point out later, many theories that are viewed as pseudoscientific when they're first introduced actually end up becoming the preferred explanation a ways down the road. So what we're going to do is clear the waters a little bit. We're going to come up with a robust definition of pseudoscience, which, after almost 2,000 years of back and forth, should be a cinch. And then we're going to explain how gratuitous use of the word became such a powerful force in shaping consensus. Finally, we'll point out some ways in which the pejorative stifles innovation due to fear of social repercussions. We start out with a question that humans have been working on for at least 2,000 years, at least since they started writing down how things happen in the natural world. And that is, how can you tell if an endeavor is scientific versus when it isn't? Aristotle advanced the premise that a scientific pursuit explains events without leaning on supernatural phenomena. He suggested that a scientific explanation would lead phenomena to be better known. In other words, science considers complex questions like how an egg develops into a chicken and breaks them down into a series of simpler processes that have already been understood. He thought of science as a gradual process where you gain understanding of one mechanism and it allows you to explain more of what you encounter in the world. But it's probably good news for him that it took nearly 2,000 years for somebody to coin the idea of pseudoscience. His mechanistic claims about the origin of animals, where scorpions emerge from basil leaves pressed between two sun-warmed bricks, and mice emerge from a mixture of straw and rags, probably would have drawn some criticism if the term was already in play. Attempting to explain everything at once will do that. When you lay the foundation for 2,000 years of scientific thinking, it's going to be a hit or miss endeavor. That's very true. In the millennia since Aristotle defined science, people who are philosophers rather than scientists have been trying to make his definition a little bit more robust. Because explaining without supernatural causes seems to only be one part of the process. And as science has taken a more central role in people's lives, it's become even more important to understand what it is, what it isn't, and what its limitations are. Three ideas from the last century have added a lot of substance to this conversation. Falsifiability, puzzle solving, and the progressive nature of the modern research program on Earth. Falsifiability as a criterion for scientific thinking was presented in 1934 by Karl Popper, an Austrian philosopher who had a front row seat for the shift away from natural philosophy and towards empiricism. Study of the natural world had recently been broken into three pieces. Biological sciences were discovering that microbes were the source of contagion, chemists were synthesizing antibiotics for the first time, and physicists were laying out new frameworks for thinking about objects that underpinned the previous two disciplines. In this milieu, it suddenly became important to define what was scientific and what was simply a well-presented load of honey. The newly industrialized world had limited resources and so needed to delineate between robust explanations and poorly conceived theories, because only the best, most reliable ideas could even be used in the development of everything from the atom bomb to fertilizer. 
And this technological mindset prioritized pragmatic utility when distinguishing science from non-science. So Popper makes a proposal. What if the scientific theories are the ones that can be falsified, at least can be imagined to be falsified, and everything else is either unscientific, metaphysics, art, or religion? In his mind, if you could come up with some experiment or demonstration that would cause you to abandon your perspective, then the idea was robustly scientific. If you couldn't, well, then it was indistinguishable from a rational belief. That doesn't seem right, answered Thomas Kuhn. Demanding falsifiability under all conditions required the same thing of verifiability, and that violated a central tenet of scientific thinking. An idea can never be proved right, since you can never know everything, so maybe it can't be proved wrong either. What if science instead was about progressively solving endlessly complex puzzles? In his writings, Kuhn used the difference between astronomy and astrology to illustrate his point. The former looks at the heavens in order to understand why the firmament looks and behaves the way that it does, while the latter constructs star charts and makes predictions about relationships. There's no why in astrology, there's no challenge to unravel, and so that's what disqualifies it from being considered a real science. Kuhn was particularly careful to word his arguments in such a way that didn't imply only the science being done right now was valid since that sort of thinking implied that science now was somehow better than science way back when. According to his view, knowledge didn't evolve towards some apex point of understanding. It unfolded away from understanding that was held in previous generations. Lastly, there's the progressive nature of the research program. And this idea came from Lakados, a Hungarian philosopher who contended that a theory could be scientific even when there wasn't a shred of evidence in its favor, and it could be pseudoscientific even if congruent with all of what was apparent. The keyword here is yet, since evaluation according to Lakados requires waiting to see if the future findings would substantiate a proposal. He considered this to be a progressive approach to the scientific question where the discipline of the moment was always evaluated in relation to predictions about the future. On the other hand, he considered a degenerative research program, the term that he used for pseudoscience. And he defined it as one that had loads and loads of data, made lots of predictions, but was proved wrong or incorrect at every turn. Rather than taking a step back and reevaluating the research program entirely, proponents of this degenerative pseudoscience create post hoc additions and adjustments that bring their theories in line with reality, which creates a cobbled together Frankenstein science monster along the way. Combining all three of these definitions, it seems that the sole difference between science and pseudoscience really comes down to intention. Does the theory attempt to approach what is actually happening in nature, or does it merely force the presenter's particular explanation upon the world at all costs? And this is where you really start to go down the rabbit hole, because if you're looking purely at the intentions of the scientists, it can seem like there's a real preference for keeping hold of a favorite theory over solving the puzzle. Under these conditions, where perturbations to an old theory are disfavored, the term pseudoscience isn't being used robustly. It just has a tendency to be applied to everything that challenges the status quo. Especially when you consider the current prevalence of scientism, a mode of thinking that believes so thoroughly in the rigors of empiricism that it says science is the only way to approach reality. It also depends on inductive reasoning, which says that data from one situation can be generalized indefinitely outwards. And if living beings were more uniform, this might actually work. But scientists are starting to figure out, even human ones, that variability between homo sapiens is enormous and nearly impossible to standardize. A drug as simple as aspirin can have very different effects across different populations. Another strange aspect of scientism is the cult of personality, where some scientists are put on a pedestal and treated like gods. In this paradigm, theories become entrenched not because they're the best theories that have ever been presented, but because the people offering them up to the public are just so good at selling. Stephen Hawking, Michio Kaku, Brian Greene, these people are ostensibly pursuing objective understanding, and yet they're treated as secular theologians who have access to incomprehensible planes of quasi-divine knowledge. Treating scientists like gods rather than fallible humans that massage data and make all kinds of mistakes tends to elevate them to an unchallengeable position of power in society. And by the time that science and the state have combined forces, the term pseudoscience becomes less about figuring out best practices and intentions, and becomes more about controlling the narrative of what theories are acceptable and which ones aren't. Paul Fairbairns, a contemporary of Lakados, saw this coming. In his work Against Method, he says that 
The consistency condition of science, which demands that new hypotheses agree with accepted theories, is unreasonable because it preserves the older theory, not the better theory. Hypotheses contradicting well-confirmed theories give us evidence that cannot be obtained in any other way. Proliferation of theories is beneficial for science, while uniformity impairs its critical power. Uniformity also endangers the free development of the individual. And when science and policy become inseparable, the ability of science to grow, shift, and change is radically stifled. Too much is riding on the words of scientists. Too much money is at stake, too much reputation. It's at this point that the term pseudoscience is less about the content of a theory and more of a dismissive insult adjacent to racial slurs and gender-based pejoratives. Yep, the goal is to insult. And the goal of that insult most of the time isn't to alert you to bad science. Instead, it's just to refer to anything that runs against consensus narrative, which is exactly what Farabend was so worried about. There are definitely disciplines that have demonstrated they are not scientific. Everything from astrology to quantum mysticism, but there's more to life than just science. Follow the intentions. Is someone making a quick buck off of you? Or are they providing a service that's actually making the world a better place? Remember, sometimes the ideas that are dismissed most vigorously when they are first proposed end up as the dominant narrative down the line. Popular ideas today like conscious control of the immune system, evolution, endosymbiosis, these are all once considered to be pseudoscience. Even the lab origins of COVID, which you humans are starting to consider again a year down the line. Certainly, many current models and established theories are bound for the dustbin. That's how it's always been, and there's no reason to think it's any different now. So remember, humans, the only way to know if a theory is scientific or not is to consider the intentions of the people writing it. Even the most far-out theories might have a grain of gold, and if you're too quick to look away, you might never find it. The conversation that follows with our friend Jeremy is all about exploring the cutting edge of what's possible, especially cutting-edge propulsion systems. What's it mean to go against the prevailing winds? How can you actually tell what's worth listening to and what's a waste of time? How do you extract the diamonds from the rubble? And if you want to go deeper, check out the references in the description. And do tell us your thoughts in the comments here or join the discussion on our Facebook group or on Twitter. This past week has been non-stop daily dives into everything from diet to industrial waste, toxins in shelf-stable foods, COVID and the flu, the nature of the electron, it's been a real mashup of demystification. Yeah, it's rad to see newcomers like Durf Nid, Tom Hartley, Steve Slater, John Sokol, and Alan Derriset jumping into the discussion. And of course, a huge thanks to all our old friends like Daniel Chen, Cheshire Cat, and Ron Park for striving to keep the group locked into the pursuit of objective understanding. And if you like this video, go over and share it on Reddit or wherever you interweb wander. And do subscribe to the channel so you don't miss next week's episode. Growing the community is imperative to brewing the best investigations and recruiting the heaviest guests. So, enjoy the interview, and until next time, demystify Sci, humies. Bye!